two, one, zero. Dire wave. method cannot justify the scientific method. Therefore, it itself is a dogmatic religious presupposition.
Brzezinski model, the technocrat model, is much more interested in the incremental, slow kill, Fabian approach to bringing technocracy into being. So they're not going to send the Homeland Security troops to round you up and put you in a FEMA camp. They'd much rather promote everybody being enmeshed in video games, uh, the Disney gulag, the virtual reality gulag, all this kind of stuff is a much better uh, FEMA camp in your home. They don't need the FEMA camp. It's it's too messy. It's a big ordeal. All this uh, that- and it's all the nonsense of all the patriot crap on the radio. That's not going to happen. They don't need to. Uh, the the shadow of global government is already here. And as we said, it's in the latter stages of the mopping up process to move it into the next phase, i.e. between two pages of the next page. There's not really any foundation. Anything can come and go. What's up, y'all? Snacks on his way. It's your favorite French friar. Friar Tuck. Friar Snack. He needs the... He needs the full room code. Let me try this again. There we go. What do you mean, what happened to the Dire Discord? Nothing happened to it. 
What up, nerds? Welcome. Uh, I'm not going to play. It's just a brief clip where Cameron, <clears throat> Cameron asks Bishop Barron, uh, what is the problem with the Orthodox Church? And why is it lacking in the uh, fullness of Catholicity or churchianity or whatever? Uh, and then Cameron gave, or Bishop Barron gave about a one and a half minute reply to Cameron. Now, if you know, and the link, the video is in the show description. So, um, Sneck had a great point about some of the elements of the assumptions that go into Bishop Barron's kind of basic reply. And I, I'm not trying to be mean, but over the years, I've never seen from Bishop Barron anything more than just a really kind of basic normie level response to all of these kinds of questions. And in a way, that's kind of the appeal of Roman Catholicism is not that it actually delivers on the uh, simplicity and ease and unity that it that it promises, but that in theory it does. It's there in theory. And so we're going to be talking about whether it actually achieves that uh, and what this admission on the part of uh, Barron in terms of orthodoxy actually signifies, right? A loss of something that the modern Roman world of Catholicism wants to recover, reinvigorate, rejuvenate. Uh, the irony is that that admission alone really proves the orthodox position because we never lost the thing that they're trying to recover. So Snacks on his way. Here he comes. So once his mic connects, uh, we'll have him, and I'll let him kind of propose the um, the thesis of what he he thinks is this is a good argument here for um, the neo patristic synthesis versus uh, what really was just always in orthodoxy. Snack, are you there? Can you hear me? Okay, his audio is connecting, so he's almost here. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Good. Is the voice okay? Yes, you're good now. Oh, perfect. Um, so we got yeah, over 300 this... nerds in the middle of the day. So thank you for bringing, drawing this big crowd. Everybody loves their fa their favorite French friar, <laughs> friar Tuck himself, Snack. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Ah, uh, really bad video. Did you play the clip already? I can play the clip. Um, I'm a little worried they might try to flag it for me playing the clip. Uh, it, I can do it. It'll play and everybody will be able to hear it. But maybe instead of um, playing it just so they don't have any reason to try to ding or copyright claim the video, which I don't, I wouldn't put that past Cameron to do. Um, everybody can, it's only a one and a half minute clip uh, in the show description. So you can go listen to the clip. It's, it's not that difficult. You'll see that we're not going to be dishonest. So basically, why don't you summarize the response that Bishop Barron gives? Basically, Cameron just says, what's the problem with the Orthodox Church? Why do they not really fulfill this conception of what the true church is? And I'll let you, Snack, explain Bishop Barron's response. And then we'll, we'll start then deconstructing this, this, uh, this reply. Yeah, so um, Bishop Barron appealed to the authority of the papacy uh, specifically by explaining that the two are the great sources of authority that this church is supposed to uphold, be it the Bible and tradition, church fathers, are, um, are meaningless. So he, he said, like, um, he said for the Bible that it's an appeal to, to text and for the church fathers that it's an appeal to distant figures. And, and that's actually the, the wrong part. And then he says that, oh, even though they might have some uh, decent mysteries, they might have um, valid sacraments and stuff like this. It's we have the fullness and we have a living connection through the papacy, which uh, which is not the case of the Protestant with the Bible and um, and the Orthodox with the, the Church Fathers.
Because it seems. Right. So we want to we want to note then also some of these kind of assumptions, uh, the overly simplistic reply here. And again, I, I understand. I want to be fair to people who maybe have listened to a lot of Bishop Barron. Um, I have listened to him over the years. Uh, there's another point that I want to make later on about his discussion with William Lane Craig over the energies. We'll hold that off for later. But I've listened to him give explanations and talks and I understand that this was kind of a on the fly, simple reply to uh, to Cameron's question. And I know that Bishop Barron has enough learning and education that if pressed, he would give longer, long, you know, much, much more uh, um, extrapolated explanations of, of how to understand each of these terms. But suffice to say that this really is the simple Roman Catholic response and apologetic. And most of the time, that's pretty much all Bishop Barron gives is just this, this simple reply. So let's start with the first claim here that we want to deconstruct snack, which is that basically orthodoxy's response is to say, go to the church fathers and councils, uh, and that'll, that'll solve the disputes. But the, this really is no better than the Protestant is what he implies in that response, as if we're just going to the church fathers like a Protestant would the Bible, and it's just the individual Orthodox guy having to fare it the best he can at you know going through this gigantic uh, series of church fathers here. I mean, that's a real problem, because if you look at history and at the councils, you see that uh, the papal authority isn't here to define dogma. They act as a bishop, a very prominent bishop, but they are not the one defining the dogma. If you look at the first council, clearly you have the theology of St. Athanasius. Second council, it's a Cappadocian, St. Basil. And and, and, uh, and pretty much, the it is not the, the Pope that, that defines this kind of dogma. It's, uh, it's it's the council itself. And they will just take the authority of the council, saying that it's it's a council because the Pope accepted it, and, and divorce it from from the church father and that's why you have people who will tell you that the second council which has a theologian uh the theology of the cappadocians uh teaches a filioque that people will start to deny um people will start to do uh, to deny essence energy distinction in the sixth council even though the, the term of the sixth council the dogmatic writings of the sixth council is by saint maximus is predicated on this so it's about picking apart tradition and eroding tradition, taking what you want. Uh, uh, even about papal authority, uh, two days ago, we had a guy coming uh, and saying, oh, you see the Pope said this about the authority of Peter, but when you put it back into context, it says the apostolic see is in three parts. It's all the patriarchs. So it's, it's always about picking apart uh, the sources of authority and, and creating this dichotomy and this conflict between Bible, the scripture, tradition, and the, the, the papal authorities that they claim. And that's plain wrong. Yep. If you look at how the church father proceeded, for example, St. Vincent of Lerins, that's a very old rule, canon of Lerins. It says, tradition is alive. It doesn't contradict the Bible. It, it is just one unified thing. We do not divorce the Bible saying that it's a prod thing, you know, appealing to the Bible is perfectly fine. That's what the fathers say. We don't divorce the father from anything else. Yeah, if you have anything to add to that. Yes. Um, let me reply on an epistemic level. So one of the things that this typical Roman Catholic response ignores is the epistemic dilemma. I brought this up many times, but allow me to illustrate it with a few books in front of me here. So um, having been Roman Catholic, I know the mindset, the modus operandi of how this actually goes down. And so when you're kind of outside of the world of Roman Catholicism and you're combating and looking at the arguments between Protestants, different Protestant groups and Roman Catholics and between Orthodox and Roman Catholics, the appearance is that, oh, well, it does seem like on a, maybe a basic level that if there was just one guy to solve the disputes, it would solve the disputes. Doesn't that make common sense to most of us that, it, that we have a final court of appeal, a final guy who just says what is the case? Roma spoke in case closed, which actually is a, a misuse of the context that, of that phrase. 
Um, but then when you get into the world of Roman Catholicism and you're presented with the different systems and the different theologians and the different uh, time periods of the medieval uh, scholastic era, uh, the, the modern debates about the neopatristic synthesis and going back to the, the, the spirit of the East and this kind of stuff at the time of Vatican II, which we'll get into, allow me to show you just a little bit of the problem here. Now, I, I was, we were told that the force of the papacy, pragmatically speaking, is the ability to provide unity and solutions to difficult matters. And yet, when you actually get into the world of Catholicism, all you do is get a whole new set of Amazon book wish lists. And now you're, now you're confronted with trying to uh, basically wind your way through the 800 pages of the sources of Catholic dogma, namely Denzinger. And then you're trying to mesh this with the thousand pages of documents of Vatican II. So because Denzinger, if you don't know, ends before Vatican II. And then you're trying to make sense of how that works with Vatican II. So, and then I don't have it in front of you, but over here on my other shelf, I have multiple binders, four or 500 page binders full of papal encyclicals, acts, decrees, post-Trent. Multiple binders, like a whole shelf of it. So... The individual Roman Catholic is just as much in an epistemically challenged position as anyone else to figuring out what the Roman Catholic dogma actually is. And so all of this repetition about the simplicity that it's supposed to provide, the easy escape unity that it's supposed to provide is all illusory. It's not there. And hence, when you become a Roman Catholic, you will go through the phases that many of these Roman Catholics are now going through, that I went through. What is Taylor Marshall doing now? Now he's a proponent of the SSPX. Prior to this, he was absolutely certain that the SSPX was wrong in his schism. And now he's gone off into the SSPX type of position. And now he's trying to do what I did, play this long-term mental gymnastics coping game of making this book mesh with this book. And guess what? There's thousands of other pages that go along with both sides of this, pre and post Vatican II. This is an exercise in futility because there's a prior epistemic question, which is about knowledge itself. So everybody's in the same boat. Nobody has a better, uh, you're not in an epistemically privileged position simply because you affirm the doctrine of the papacy in Vatican I. Because now you have to go make sense of Vatican I in line with what's prior to Vatican I and what's after Vatican I, namely Vatican II. So just on a basic epistemic level, it doesn't work. It moves the problem back a step. And we have illustrated this argument hundreds of times over. But it, the amazing thing to me is that you get these normie kind of Roman Catholic apologists, and I would classify Bishop Barron in that category of normie apologists, that just repeat this as if that really solves the issue. It's just in theory, because in the Roman Catholic world, you're immediately going to be pre presented with all of these problems and making the dogmas mesh. So just on the epistemic level, it doesn't actually do what they want it to do. Yeah, correct. And then, um, since we're at it, can you, can you show in the Danzinger uh, what forms the first millennium and what forms the second millennium, just to show yeah. that there's a move towards... To, towards a papal authority later on because that, yeah, that yeah, would be interesting point, yeah so the first looks like looking for the first point where it so as you can see here in denzinger the first 350 54 the first 354 roughly Roughly around in here. Yeah, so that's, so that's, that, that's that much of the book. Okay. That much of the book, the skinny part versus this much of the book post Vatican or post uh, second millennium. Yeah. And the Denzinger is not complete. The Denzinger stops at some point. So today, if there was a new, if, if the Denzinger was published with whatever is uh, deemed uh, authoritative enough, uh, there will be fights <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, right yeah and then something else some people will then when you will show this and say look what we do in the church fathers in the council you have to do in your magisterium 
which many Catholic cannot define. They will say, oh, at least we have infallibility, so we know that some stuff is true. Same problem. There is no agreement. There is no agreement. Uh, there is no list of what's infallible. People debate what's infallible all the time. So it removes the problem just one step further again. Exactly. So epistemically, it is it is terrible. I mean, the Catholic world right now is divided over whether this book is infallible and in what sense the different documents even amongst themselves are or are not infallible. Um, by the way, I'm going to eventually make a video in the next few days about the fact that according to Vatican I, the universal ordinary magisterial requirements for, uh, for that level of dogma are all met here. So it really doesn't matter whether you want to class Vatican II uh, as extraordinary magisterium, which I actually think it is. Uh, but even if you don't think it's extraordinary and somehow you want to class it as universal ordinary, it still is within the promise, according to Vatican I, of the Petrine charism and infallibility. So they're not really escaping any. It's just a cope and a kind of a, a, a deflection mechanism to say, oh, well, I don't actually have to um, accept Vatican II. Uh, no, guess what? When If you're an SSPX person and you actually reconcile to the Novus Ordo, like the FSSP people did and are, they're reconciled. That's a whole group of SSPX who, who at one time went back to Rome. Do you know what they had to do when they came back to Rome? Accept Vatican II. If you could not accept Vatican II and still be in communion with Rome, then why is there an FSSP? This is really obvious and simple. It shouldn't even be debated. Yeah, correct. So um, maybe back to the church fathers uh, and the claim. So you hear what um, Bishop Barron did is trying to erode the church father. And actually, that's very funny because that's a classic Roman Catholic tactic. So maybe people know about the modernist crisis. The modernist crisis started because you had Roman Catholic priests and apologists that started to attack the Protestant by denigrating the Bible and saying the Bible has errors in it. The, using you know modern atheist arguments, saying you cannot base yourself on the Bible because the Bible has errors, therefore you need something else. So it's um, literally burning. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, scorched earth theory, um, the tactics. And because of this, the Pope had to actually say, you know, we cannot really deny the Bible. So that's where the syllabus of errors and so on come, comes exactly. in. And by I'm the way, that. Today, yeah, syllabus of errors, yeah. today, most uh, most Catholic uh, priests would not teach uh, uh, biblical inerrancy anyway. Right. So that will be a contradiction. Yeah, Lamentabili, syllabus of errors, Morari Vols. I mean, these are all uh, actually not just encyclicals, but actually are contained in different areas and sections in, in Denzinger as well. At least the principles there, Lamentabili is here. Uh, the condemning the errors of the modernist um, sections of Pachindi, I think, are also included here. Uh, and that would mean that, yes, these are in this. I mean, according to what everybody thought prior to Vatican II, that's all dogma. Oh, but now we're supposed to revise what we thought was dogma after Vatican II. Oh, no, actually, none of those condemnations of modernism were dogma. They were just the ordinary teaching of the time that wasn't universal. I mean, that's just ludicrous. I mean, at this point, we're just inventing categories to make the system work. And that's the real problem here. Let's get to the next point uh, that, that Barron makes, which is the, the, the Orthodox position he implies is that uh, even though it's odd because he knows that we do have apostolic succession and he believes that and admits that. So why he would say that we don't have a direct connection to the apostles and that we are just looking to, quote, distant figures. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised why he would uh, phrase it that way, given that he admits that we have absolute succession. But let's, let's take the next section of his argument, which is that you can't look to distant figures because you don't have a living magisterium. Now, the problem with this is, for him, living magisterium equals papacy. I mean, uh, I think that's a point where he completely refuted his own position, because... The church fathers are not distant figures. They are, they are being praised, they are being taught, we sing the liturgy, um, and they themselves uh, don't consider one another uh, as distant figures. Exactly. So if, if you look at what we could say modern church fathers, for example, Justin Popovich, Popovich just says, I'm just stating what has been said before me. And Palamas, so that's... Uh, uh, that, that would not be uh, traditionally considered a church father. He says, oh, I'm just using what came before me, namely the arguments of Photius. 
and St. John of Damascus did the same thing, and Cyril of Alexandria did the same thing, and Athanasius did the same thing, and even the Apostolic Fathers. So that's the thing. This is a living link, and they're, they're clearly stating that it's a living link. But why would someone consider them distant figures? This is because of um, academics, namely, I think it's Lutherans, but Western academics moved away yes. and, and started to categorize the church in, in, in ages. And they would say, oh, you've got the apostolic age, then you've got the father age, then uh, patristic age, uh, then you have the scholastic age, and, and then you have uh, whatever you have today. <laughs> I don't know what I would call it. Um, so that's... Uh, Western, uh, I believe Lutheran categories that the Roman Catholic Church yes. has adhered to simply because they're responsible for these categories. They're responsible from the fall, for the fall of the fathers and and the switch to uh, logical, philosophical argument with scholasticism. If you look at yes. uh, Council of Lacanay, that's exactly uh, that's exactly the whole point of the council. You have uh, people who are making scholastic argumentation versus Saint Gregory Palamas, who states what has been said before him by all the fathers. So, there are distant figures for 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 the Roman Catholic. Because yes, the, this is a key way. point in your in this argumentation that you that you've uh, highlighted here, which is if they're distant figures, then you have distanced yourself from them for some reason. But the Orthodox Church has never distanced themselves from ourselves, from the fathers. We don't believe there was an age of the church fathers that came to an end. That's why Palamas will argue that the experience of Paul is the same as the experience of Moses, is the same as the experience of Basil, and is the same as the experience of the Hesychast. There's no difference. It's not, there's not all these different ways and paths and mystical approaches. It's one experience of the divine throughout the entire, the entire time period. So the mere admission of a loss of the Eastern spirit, of the uh, reviving of the both lungs of the church, she needs to breathe with both lungs, the, the, uh, you know, the von Balthasar trying to re- you know, he wrote, he was, uh, you know, prominent during this period, writing these whole big fat books, trying to, we got to incorporate uh, Maximus. We got to bring Maximus into all this. This is the source for Vatican II's attempt to bring in um, Eastern theology. But the irony here is that once again, we're seeing that in all of these attempts, these are, these are admissions of the things that Orthodoxy was arguing the whole time, right? For example, collegiality. That Vatican II, oh, look, we're giving you all of this leeway. We're admitting all of these things about collegiality. We're going to give you the benefit of the doubt, uh, Eastern people, about the, the collegial process. There's the Chieti document where uh, Rome basically admits a lot of these orthodox arguments. There's the Vatican clarification on the filioque where the Vatican admits all of these orthodox arguments and finally says, yes, we admit all these points. Uh, we've been unclear in the West for the last several centuries. We grant you this. There's still tension between East and West on the double hypostatic procession. Um, but uh, look, we're going to give you all this, so come back to us. But the point is, is that if you're admitting all of those points, doesn't that suggest that we were right all along, that you moved away, that you lost something that was present? Why would you need to revive the Eastern spirit and the church fathers in this neopatristic revival? if you had the goods all along. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's it's not like the church fathers were not normative. You can look at history, you can look at the councils. They always call the fathers, a, um, Ubi Petrus has a full list of uh, what makes authority that you can find, you can find it anywhere. So the fathers have always been the normative things. And if you're saying that you return to the fathers, that means that you let them. That means that you abandon the, the, the canon of tradition. And incidentally, that's why you're fighting the Bible as well, because the fathers are not different from Scripture. Right. The fathers always argue from Scripture. That's always their starting point in all of their demonstration since the beginning. So uh, that's really an admission of, uh, of failure. And even even quotes uh, Newman. They say, oh, we're a follower of Newman and the Eastern Orthodox have good theology. Maybe that's why the fathers are not distant figures to us. Newman uh, had to, re <laughs> you know, reintroduce the fathers in the Roman Catholic scheme and he, he still had to you know doctor them a little bit you know he had to um to to create understandings of the fathers like oh this is just a private opinion oh you know, they're talking about creation it, it must not be right stuff like this so he had to reintroduce the father with his own categories he had to rework the fathers to fit them back into the church meaning that not only uh, it means that the Roman Catholic Church has abandoned the fathers, 
but also that um, it's uh, it, it still cannot fully accept them. They have to be rogue. We have to say, oh, it's a private opinion. Oh, we have to put them back into scholastic categories to create like a, a, a mixed uh, system between scholasticism and patristics. Yeah. Let's take another uh, uh, modus operandi of the, the present day Roman apologists and how they operate. Uh, most of the time, 90, 95% of the time, whether it's Baron or a, or a, a Matt Frat or a, 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 an Eric Ibarra, what they're going to do is say, look, um, go to what the Roman See has confirmed. This is going to solve the problems. Just look to Rome. Just look to Rome. The papacy, the papacy, the papacy. Over and over and over. McKees, McKees, McKees. Now, let's wonder and ask at this point, why is that not the modus operandi in the first millennium? When the church fathers are debating, right? Do they do this default modus operandi of McKees, 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 Peter? No, they don't. Why is that? Why does John of Damascus write an entire systematic theology, right? Encompassing everything that he thinks is, is the faith, the Orthodox faith for the first seven centuries. He's a doctor in the Roman Catholic Church, right? So he's uh, one of the highest levels of teaching authority. He's considered to be the last church father, you know. In the, in this the is what they consider the last church father. Now, I'm not making an argument about, well, we don't believe that the church fathers are infallible. I know that. That's not the point I'm making. My, the point is, how can he write a the systematic theology summarizing the seven centuries prior to him with no mention of Peter, no mention of Rome, no mention of, of the, the Sea of Rome and its some um, special charism? It's, it's not there. What does he do? He appeals to scripture. He appeals to the previous teaching of the mind of the church, the phronema. If you study the church fathers, if you get into the church fathers, and you, we don't do this in an academic exercise divorced from the life of the church. This is another thing that the Roman Catholic system doesn't grasp about orthodoxy. They think of it like, well, I, if I can't go find an academic book that presents to me the list of infallible dogmas, then your church doesn't have dogma. But we have a totally different paradigm for how an individual comes to be catechized and to know and actually experience, as Palamas says, infallibility itself. We actually can participate in that energy of God, according to St. Gregory Palamas. Now, that sounds fantastical to the Roman Catholic, but this is the whole purpose of the direct perception of God. We don't put created intermediaries there as if we can only know created effects in this life. We really do believe that the individual... And every, this is, this is something St. Simeon, the new, new theologian, stressed, is that this is not something reserved for five or six monastics. Every Orthodox person has the potential to really come to know and experience God in this, this powerful way. It would be the Massalian heresy to say that only a few select five people actually come to know and experience God. That's, that's the era of Massalianism. And St. Simeon was actually kicked out of his monastery for saying that this was a, a possible uh, experience for every Orthodox Christian. But we have to say that because of the, the power and meaning of the sacraments, right? the reality of baptism, the reality of the Lord's Supper, these are uh, uh, there and available to uh, every Orthodox Christian. And therefore, there's no, like, there's no uh, dialectical opposition between this uh, magisterial body and the mystical body. This is actually a division that comes to be in the late middle, uh, the uh, early Middle Ages, the late quote patristic period from the Roman Catholic mindset, where they will literally they will have a new distinction that they develop between the the mystici, uh, the, the magisterial uh, body, and the uh, mystici corporis, right, the mystical body. This is an invented distinction to make a higher level status of the magisterial members of the church from the normative. Uh, bishops and priests and, and laity. So now we get these gradations of what it is to be a Christian and what it, and so now, and you can see why they would do that because who has to have the superpower, the super bishopric Rome, right? You'll never find that distinction anywhere in the first seven centuries, eight centuries. It's a later in, in invention. A lot of scholars have actually, actually covered this with the two bodies theology about how there's a new magisterial level of what it is to be a Christian that is beyond anything in the patristic conception. And it goes along with what we're talking about today, which is that you do not find the church fathers in the first seven centuries appealing to this second higher tier of magisterial Christian, right? Bishop, the cardinal, perhaps Pope, right? Above the level of the normative uh, Christian experience. Now, 
at that juncture, every Roman Catholic will say, oh, well, then uh, you, uh, uh, you don't have any magisterium and it's every man's opinion. No, this is why, again, it's it's not a matter of where is the book that lists all the infallible dogmas? It doesn't work that way. It's more nuanced than that. In order, in other words, you're going to have to be in the liturgy, be catechized in the church, and to get the mind of the church, which itself is miraculous, before you can understand and know what this is. The unbelieving world cannot understand and know this because they are not initiated into the mysteries. So the mere idea that you think you can just present this book that lists all the infallible dogmas itself is off base from the outset. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, we, we, we could even say that we have magisterium. We have the councils. Sure. But the councils only have an appeal to the fathers. And the council are just an expression of the Laurentian canon, which is we need to believe what has been believed by all always since the beginning. So the, the councils are just attesting of a pre-existing tradition and, and each of the fathers are attesting that this has been taught to them. This is a real meaning of apostolic succession. What's the point of having someone who's formerly the successor of an apostle if he cannot even bring you the same teaching? <laughs> right. What's the point? That's, that's the entire point of apostolic succession. Yeah, I, I want to stress to that point you made about the, the this is a new kind of approach, and I want to give credit to Dr. Branson for uh, hipping me to this point. Uh, Dr. Bill Branson made a great uh, uh, just passing point that he said, look, <clears throat> in the Roman Catholic mindset, you can basically quote mine the, the councils or the fathers for whatever you're really needing to prove at the moment and whatever you want to be the case ex post facto. But that doesn't really make sense with how the church itself operated and acted in these different centuries. For example, if you look at Nicaea, it's dominated, as you pointed out, Snack, by certain theologians and certain um, dogmatic writers. Right? Nicaea is obviously dominated by Athanasius. Athanasius is the, is the father of that council. Now, I'm not saying that that means for us Athanasius becomes like a de facto pope. It doesn't work like that, right? The creed that's that's there at the council and the homoousion teaching is obviously, I think everybody should know this, from the theology and apologetic of Athanasius, right? So St. Athanasius' theology dominates that council, and he's the father who, in a way, miraculously, you could say, represents the mind of the church at that time. And so, not because he's a single guy, but because the mind of the church accepted his teaching in the council, you see. So you can't really divorce the Nicene Creed from the theological argumentation of Athanasius. That should be obvious. It kind of should kind of be you know common sense, and that that itself does not mean that well. So Athanasius never got anything wrong. No, we're not saying that. We're just saying that in order to get the mind of the church for Nicaea, it's impossible to do that divorced from the theology of Athanasius. Likewise, if you come to Constantinople one. You cannot really grasp the theology and the addition to the creed at Constantinople I apart from the Cappadocians. It's really, again, not even controversial to say that Cappadocian theology crystallizes the triad for us at Constantinople I, the next ecumenical council. So when we look at what the Cappadocians teach, do they de facto just appeal to Rome? No. Basil has multiple, multiple letters where he says Rome was worthless in the, the disputes that he was engaging in. I've covered that in my Basil uh, uh, talk on his letters uh, and uh, uh, as writings. So so St. Basil didn't uh, obviously use this appeal to Rome. St. Gregory of Nazianzus didn't just do this de facto appeal. Well, whatever the Pope says. They wrote all these theological treatises arguing their position on the Trinity. And so what happens is the, the council meets... And they look and they debate. This is why Ibarra had to retract his position on Pope Leo's tome being ex cathedra because he later found out, oh, they're actually reading and debating whether it's orthodox. They're not just de facto accepting that whatever he said is true, right? So when you, when you consider that you can't divorce the Niceno-Constantopolitan Creed from the theological teaching of the fathers who produced it, then you start to see why this Roman Catholic approach it's ironic. They're actually the ones that are doing the Protestant thing. They don't care about the mind of the fathers. They will mind the, 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 the councils and the fathers for whatever proves their ex post facto second millennium presupposition. They don't care about what the mind of the fathers was, right? Because if they did, they would know that as Sashinsky himself, when he was Roman Catholic scholar, admitted 
they don't, the Cappadocians don't teach Filioque. And so the Constantinopolitan Creed, Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed doesn't teach the Filioque. It's not there. It's excluded by their teaching of the Father as the sole cause. So you see why this immediately begins to present problems for the Roman Catholic position. And as you know, Sneck, the uh, historic response to this was 29 or so forgeries, right? How are we going to back up this indefensible position? We will use these 29 infamous forgeries to prove from the outset that the East has no response to us. It doesn't matter, East. I'm going to cancel you all out because of, and I'm going to go, we're, we're going to hit some of these again because it bears repeating in this discussion. If the Roman Catholic Church had the goods, if the Roman See had the goods, as they claim, the Vatican I type of mindset, and remember, Vatican I says all you got to do is go look at church history, look at the church fathers, and you'll see that the Roman See always had the Vatican I view of the Roman See. Wait a minute, Bishop, wait a minute, Bishop, wait a minute, Bishop Barron. I thought you said that we can't just go see these things simply in the fathers. Yet Vatican I claims at the very beginning, everyone knows when you just go read the church fathers, you will find out that the Roman See was always infallible, have supreme jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What did they use to prove this for centuries? 29 ex admitted forgeries. Yeah, that's not an exhaustive list. And, um, people would say oh yes yeah, they're actually um they're actually decent texts and so on uh, that's kind of weird you know if they're legitimate texts why weren't this one being used yeah why do you why? need 29 <laughs> forgeries if you've got the goods it's like yeah it doesn't even make any sense exactly. right because again remember yeah. remember the language of Vatican one is that it's abundantly clear everybody can go read this and see this it's obvious that the church in all centuries taught vatican one view yeah, Vatican One even goes further and says that all of the fathers taught this. So good, if you want to disprove point. Vatican One, just need to find one. And we found one, we called it Basil. Um, you, a lot of them are taken out of context. You know, the famous um, uh, from Augustine, you know, uh, Rome, uh, Roma locuta est, uh, cosa finita est. It's actually in the letter where he complains about Rome interfering. And, and he actually participated in councils that denied uh, Rome's um, Rome's authority over the Church of Carthage, which was based on uh, forgeries as well. <laughs> so there's a lot of these things, but basically the church never works that way. And if you have to attack scripture, and if you have to attack church father, which as a living representative of the tradition, then it means something's wrong. And you cannot appeal to clarity in the magisterial mess that is the Roman church. Yeah, and th this goes back to that classical foundationalist peripatetic axiom approach of Vatican I that it codified that, well, you just go read the text and they, they mean what they say. Uh, just go read what the church fathers say, and it should be obvious to everyone that they teach uh, the Roman, the Vatican I view of papal infallibility. Really, is that how texts work, that they, they're not theory-laden? You just see what it means? This is what literally every Protestant apologist, when they say sola scriptura, they say, just go read the text. It means what it says, bro. Right. Ignoring the fact that there's no such thing as like this privileged position that you just look at the text and it's a it's a neutral brute fact. And it's just obvious what it means. No texts come with a context, you see. And just as for us against the Protestant, the context of the Bible is the liturgy. It's not your private devotional book that you get to take outside of the liturgy. That's an illicit stealing of our book. Oh, I'm going to go in my little prayer corner and read my Bible uh, I don't need your church. I don't need your normative authority, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a silly position. Well, in the same way, the Roman Catholic does the opposite of the Protestant and says, I don't need any of this church father stuff. Really, all I need is just whatever the Pope said, right? I will let the Pope tell me what the church father said. Really? Then why were there 29 plus famous forgeries? that Rome used for centuries. By the way, these are not obscure texts. The Catechism of Trent has, a, what, 12, 14 citations from these forged documents, Pseudo-Isidorian Decretals? Yeah, there are even uh, Bibles that have uh, uh, forged commentaries. Actually, Newman, you know, since we quoted him, Newman notices that, um, uh, for example, there were fake quotes of Cyril in, in Aquinas' books which were also used, uh, you know, at, at councils, Aquinas uh, used uh, two compilation, 
ones that was really filled with forgeries and other ones that was a little bit better. It's it, it's really weird. And, and, and you know, yeah, they're not obscure texts. There's a, there's a basis for um, for the papal claims for hundreds of years. The donation of Constantine, for example, that's the one text that's being used. They don't use whatever whatever quote mines they, they use today, uh, because a lot of them have been forged later on, or because in context it simply appears it's, that it's not what it claims. They use the donation of Constantine, and the donation of uh, of Constantine was used against uh, temporal powers for hundreds of years. And actually, the, the donation of Constantine is a text that motivated the modern critic uh, critical method, because everybody was pissed off at this text and uh, all the rulers of europe uh, were being annoyed by this text so they, they promoted the um uh, crit um, textual criticism of, the, of this text yeah, and, 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 and this is a, an additional argument i want to make re in relation to this which is that uh you know according to vatican one really the catechism of trent should be classed in some form of ordinary magisterium whether you want to make it universal or just ordinary magisterial catechetical teaching i mean obviously this had the normative approbation and approval of the roman see for centuries after vatican or excuse me after trent so i mean this should obviously express the traditional catholic teaching there's no traditional catholic in the world who doesn't think that this expresses the traditional catholic teaching and if there are some 12 14 or more roughly uh, uh, citations of forgeries, where was the Roman Catholic papal infallibility and inerrancy when the Pope didn't know that these were forgeries? Where was that? I'm supposed to believe that he's the inerrant guide on dogma, and yet he doesn't know that this catechism that he approves is citing numerous instances of forgeries to prove his dogma? How am I supposed to believe in inerrancy and infallibility in that in that sense? Now they'll say, "Well, he's not always infallible," and let me give you all the coping mechanisms to explain when he is and when he isn't. Which, by the way, is all a fallible interpretation because you're just an individual Catholic, right? You would actually need to show the Pope giving this criteria, right? So, in other words, you need an epistemic criteria uh, that comes from the Pope to tell you when the documents are and are not infallible. But that's bypass because the definition of infallibility is applying ipso facto. Yeah. So you cannot even give this. You can't even give that, right? even if you wanted to, because if you wanted to, you could just say, yeah, you know, you telling me that it's ex cathedra is not ex cathedra. Exactly. That's what, actually what some what some people say uh, with the declaration of John Paul II that appears very authoritative on, on women clergy. So yeah, no epistemic certainty. Um, maybe back to the Church Fathers. Yeah. So. Um, that's why yeah, you have a problem. And actually, Bishop Barron admits it. So he says, yeah, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm a proponent of Newman, who himself had to adapt the church father to bring them back in. Um, and he says, yeah, in, to some extent, uh, as the Orthodox, uh, I've, kept, um, I've kept some mysteries better. Uh, I love their theology. He even made videos on um, way, of, way of a Pilgrim. A yeah. way of a Pilgrim is just expressing the Philokalia. It's, it's predicated on the fathers. It's the same experience as the experience of Seraphim of Saraf, the um, the Ezekiel monks, say Saint Basil, Saint Paul, and Moses. So it's 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 linked, and that's why they have to leech into into Eastern tradition to try to bring that, you know, and say, oh, you know, with a rational Western mind, with the brains, you are the uh, more mystical side. No, we have the totality of things, and you cannot say, I believe that this guy can serve this stuff better. But we have the totality of things. No, you should. How do you have the if totality you, if you didn't preserve it better? Yeah, I mean, if you have like, to it doesn't import make any it sense. From us. It's ludicrous. If you have to import something from us, that means you didn't have it. Yeah, and so what we start to see here is that, in line with Vatican II, really this is an affirmation of uh, the kind of perennial perspective that the the papacy and the Roman Catholic religion is really just kind of uh, the top of a chain of being of religions. Right. This is paving the way, I believe, for um, where the Roman Catholic Church is going to go in the next uh, few decades and perhaps century into being um, the the top of a kind of world federation of religions. Uh, so actually, pap the, the, the Roman bishop. Right. So remember, if if in the first millennium, what we learned was that the, the Roman bishop, according to the Roman Catholic perspective, is the head of the church. 
right? This is kind of becoming clear in the Roman Catholic mindset uh, at the end of the first millennium. This is where we begin to see the rise of the Roman primacy. The second millennium of the papacy is where the Pope uh, kind of comes to his self-realization that he's also the head of all temporal authority, right? And he can excommunicate. He's the basically Lord of all emperors uh, and all emperors and, and civil state must also basically uh, submit to whatever he wants to do in terms of war, right? You have the, uh, uh, is it Medici uh, or Alexander? One of the Medici guys basically excommunicating um, temporal uh, rulers who won't give the, him uh, his armies. <laughs> so if, you, if you're a king of some princi principiate and you don't give uh, Alexander, your armies, he will excommunicate you, right? So it's like, so now he's the the god emperor, not just of the church, but also of all uh, temporal emperors. And then in the new millennium, the new revelation is that, ah, oh, the Pope is actually now the head of all the world religions. That's where we're going with this. Pachamama. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big problem. So that's the thing with... Um, conflicting um yeah, that's a classical method now eroding scripture eroding tradition to prop up magisteria i was looking for the statement in i've got uh, vatican one pulled up here uh let's see and i was looking for where it says that it was always the case that you could just go and look oh uh, yeah for it no one can be in doubt it was known in every age that peter had universal supremacy that he had the keys that he alone could give this um, all of his successors exercised the exact same judgment and authority as Peter in terms of being infallible, inerrant. So this is chapter two. Um, it's towards the end. Let's see which decree is this. This is session four when you get down to the bottom. Um, and it's uh, four, section two, paragraph two. It says that this was always the case, right? Everybody knows this. It was always the case. Everyone knows. It's obvious. <laughs> And uh, they cite a source. Let's see what source they cite. Um, they just cite Ephesus. Oh, so uh, Ephesus says, and this is from Denzinger, right? So here's Vatican One citing, I think it's Denzinger. It says D. Uh, from the, the speech of Philip at Ephesus, D number 112. Uh, it's probably Denzinger. I don't know. But the point is that and, and we've covered that with Ubi, by the, for, by the way, the, the different claims. Of, oh, well, what about this statement in Ephesus? What about this statement in uh, Chalcedon? Let me see if it is in Denzinger. Yes, yeah, so that, that's all we can come Yeah, what it this. says is that P Peter is, uh, has the keys. It says, Pete, by the way, nobody in orthodoxy has ever denied that Peter has the keys, right? Um, and that's really all it says, right? His successors uh, can confirm and can approve of councils. I mean, there's nothing in that statement of Peter, Denzinger 112, that an orthodox person would disagree with. Do you know, you know the phrase I'm talking about? It's one that Roman Catholics often bring up. I think Ubi covers it in one of his... Yeah, and again, there's a good, um, good work by Ubi that shows that everybody claims to be. Um, I want to see this um, essay where Ubi covers basically all of the different, or at least a large section of the quotes that are used by Roman Catholics to try to show that Peter alone has this succession. Here is Ubi's Florigelium, and you'll notice as you go through this essay, you've got Cyprian, Bede, Isidore, Chrysostom, writing to Basil, Pope Alexander, Leo the Great, Gregory the Great, some of the later uh, Latin fathers, uh, Hilary, Afrehat, Dionysius, St. Theodore Studite. And what it, what it usually will say is, what a lot of these quotes will say, is that when you see Matthew 16, 17, and 18, right, there's nothing about that that only Peter has this restriction, right? And so when you go and you look at Matthew 18, right? Because in Matthew 18, Jesus says the exact same thing to the other apostles. He says, you all, right, have the ability to bind and to lose. So Matthew 16 can't be divorced from Matthew 18. 
Because the same thing that's said to Peter is said to the whole College of the Apostles. And that's why Dvornik, in his book Byzantium and Roman Primacy, says that really the, the mind of the church fathers is pretty consistent. I'll read the quote. Uh, to whom was this promise of binding and loosen, loosing given? Dvornik says it was given to the apostles and their successors. Who are the successors? He who occupies the throne of Rome is first in this succession, but also there is the throne of Constantinople II, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. In the mind of the early church, meaning the first millennium, this is the pentarchic authority in the church. It is to them that all the decisions belong in terms of divine dogmas. The emperor, as the secular authority, had the duty to aid and to confirm what these church leaders in council came to, you see. So just this idea that because there's a statement to Peter or because there's a honor and privilege, privilege given to the Roman see that therefore it's to the exclusion of the others is ludicrous. It's totally interpolated. Yeah, exactly. And this appeal to the keys and, and to the to the rock is actually appeals to the church fathers. Uh, the rock is a confession uh, of Peter. Uh, we believe that it's it is also Peter in the sense of the um, universal episcopate. So we believe uh, that this is his authority of teaching that is expressed in all the apostles. Same stuff for the keys. So these verses are appeals to the authority of the Father, which we follow, which is why the Father is important. Yeah, this is also relevant too when you can go to <clears throat> um, Ubi's uh, essay that he did on what makes a council in, uh, ecumenical, quote unquote. So he did another Florigelium, and, and all. All that you need to know from this essay, it's a great essay, is that the the statements by different church fathers, for example, what makes the council ecumenical? Uh, Basil, Augustine, Chalcedon, and Gregory the Great will all specifically say that it's the universal consensus of all the bishops. Other councils and fathers like Chalcedon, Constantinople II, Nicaea II, St. Theresios and St. Nicephorus will say that it's also patriarchal ratification. Other um, features that go into this are the great number of saints and holy men present. John of Damascus, St. Athanasius will say this. St. Maximus the Confessor will say that also ultimately what makes the council ecumenical is that it is in fact a true council. It's teaching truth. Okay, so that's the argument you usually hear, hear me give. It's directly from St. Maximus. There's nothing wrong with saying that the council is ecumenical because it's true. It's it, obviously, if we believe that ecumenical councils don't err, then it has the feature of being true. Um, other, there are some church fathers that will say that ratification by Rome will play a role in this because Rome was considered first in the patriarchal list. This is Socrates and Sozomen. Um, other bishops will say at times it is like Hinkmar that it is the great number. Now, it's not always based on number. The point is that when you look at the teaching of all of these church fathers, which is, again, presupposing that it's not just what the Pope says about what a council is, but rather the mind of the church, right? We're gathering a notion of what the mind of the church says in the first 800 years, first millennium, about what makes a council ecumenical. Now, other things occur too, like, for example, the eventual reception of those councils, right? So, for example, in the Orthodox Church, um, after Byzantium, or as Byzantium begins to wane, you have councils and you have synods that are still normative and accepted by the Orthodox world, even though they're not necessarily, quote, ecumenical councils due to the no longer existing ecumene empire, right? So you have Palamite synods that are normative, accepted, it's passed into our liturgy. Everybody knows that in the uh, Lenten Triodion, I think, right? Don't you have the, the day of, uh, of uh, St. Gregory Palamas? Right. So the affirmation of the energies has entered into our liturgical normativity. Obviously, that means that we have to accept Black Herne and the Palamite Synods in contrast to 1274 of Lyons of the Roman Catholics. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going really long winded, uh, Snack, but uh, I want you to, to, to chime in here. Oh, it's fine. Um, um, you know, if we were to summarize this, this very short video, we can show that. Bishop Barron just demonstrated that he lost uh, that his church lost touch with the fathers. That the fathers are indeed authoritative. Also lost touch with uh, with scripture, incidentally, holy tradition, 
And at the same time, they need to claim that they need to import or theology. They need to import or, um, um, yeah, he, he says we can serve stuff better than, better than he did. So ultimately, I think that this very half-baked statement just displays what's wrong. The mentality that is actually showing that it's wrong. And even up into Gregory the Great, you have that shared Petrine notion. I really appreciated that uh, that uh, letter from Gregory the Great that you shared, where he just goes into the fact that Peter C is the three C's that descend from Peter. <laughs> so even in his day, uh, he's recognizing that uh, this is not like some unique thing that the charism of Petrine power only passed into um, the succession of bishops at Rome, right? So the, the, the point is that the Roman Catholic position just tends to rest on a lot of uh, interpolations, forgeries, assumptions, and reading back into things that the church father said when it's obviously a lot more nuanced and it's a lot more, um, there's a lot more uh, uh, Catholicity, you could say, or uh, broad-mindedness in the sense of what the, the mind of the church is. The mind of the church is all of these people. It's not the Roman see. And this is why you get a shift in the mind and operation of the church in the first millennium and the mind and operation of the Latin church in the second millennium, because there's obviously a shift. Now, why would there need to be a shift if the church is functioning, guided and protected and working just as it is perfectly fine for the first millennium to a whole new way of doing things in the second millennium? And why would Bishop Barron say that we've got to recover what was lost. It's essential. Yeah, and again, Catholicity is not only about, you know, building churches in the middle of Antarctica. Catholicity is about keeping the entirety of the deposit. Right. So when St. Gregory the Great says that um, the patronacy is supreme, you cannot just pick this quote and, and just elude the, the, uh, the other quote where he says that the patronacy is in other places. When um, St. Irenaeus of Lyon says that you have to refer to Rome, you cannot just pick this quote and remove it from its context and remove it from Irenaeus saying that Rome is founded by Peter and Paul equally, which is anathema uh, in the Denzinger. Yeah, he also so, doesn't say anything about P uh, the Roman see having any kind of special uh, infallible charism or privilege. He just says that... Yeah, he's referring to... He says it's highly to, honored because Peter and Paul established it. He doesn't say anything about a Petrine succession that's that has a special charism. Yeah, and it's also the it's also the, the biggest uh, church, which is why uh, uh, it's the biggest church in the in the West, which is why there are appeals to it. So yeah, that's the thing. You need to have the entirety of the fathers. You cannot, you know, for example, just uh, claim the Second Council without the mind of Saint Basil. Yeah. You cannot just pick exactly. stuff apart. And by the way, that goes for the president too. The president who like to to do court minds and try to to use the fathers, and they also try to reintegrate the fathers. Um, uh, well, um, not really reintegrate, but integrate the fathers in their church. Um, some of them will call St. John of uh, St. John Chrysostom a preacher, <laughs> uh, a pastor, uh, stuff like this. So, yeah, ultimately, the fathers matter, and all of them in uh, in context when they speak in unison, yes. they're into canon. Um, I, if you need to go, mm -hmm. I don't want to keep you too long. There's a couple things I want to hit on. You're welcome to stay, but I don't know if you're needing to go or if you just wanted this to be a quick video. It's but fine. We can we, we can maybe conclude and, and we can uh, answer the super chat journey. Yeah, um, I did want to go through briefly because a lot of people in the in the in the chat were asking about what are these forgeries. So um, you can write these down. I'll try to put this here for a little bit for a few seconds so people who are watching can read what they are, but. So here are, um, this is from George, uh, the uh, buddy of ours that Snack knows that we did a stream with me and Snack and George. So you can go find that uh, list. It's called Fatima, Forgeries. I forget how I, how I titled it, but it's the only, it's the only video on my, my channel about Fatima. So go uh, watch that. But if you want the fuller treatment of these, but basically for, you know, the late medieval, uh, or excuse me, early medieval through the medieval period until... Uh, basically renaissance scholars like lorenzo valla who began to call these things into question you have a constant uh, a, a train of, of papal uh, de declarations and appeals to things that and and also other roman Catholics like aquinas to documents that are largely 
um, forgeries, interpolations, just complete made up things like the donation of Constantine. Um, this was what was appealed to for so long to prove the temporal authority of the Roman bishop. Um, you've got the pseudo Isidorian decretals. You've got the Catina uh, Area of Aquinas, which uses the uh, Libellius. And by the way, I have the Catina right here. Um, it has a whole bunch of forged quotes in it from pseudo Chrysostom and people like that. There are the forgeries in the Catechism of Trent that I mentioned from the Isidorian decretals. There's Gratian's interpolation of Trollo. There are the misquotations of the Seventh Ecumenical Council that Rome uses. There's the misquotation of St. Stephen the Younger. There's the ascribing of the Sardican Council canons to the Nicene Council. There's the interpolations of the Sixth Canon of Nicaea. There are the Arabic, Arabic canons of Nicaea, the interpolation of the Code of Canons of the African Church, the Testament of the Patriarch Joseph at Council Florence, variations in the Acts of the Council of Nicaea and related letters between the Latin and the Greek copies, variations in the Acts of the Council of Chalcedon, the spurious letter of Athanasius to Pope Felix II, the Pseudo-Isidorian Decretal, um, uh, the misinterpolation of Roma, Roma Locuta Est, Cosa Finita Est, the spurious epistles of the 14th century concerning purgatory, Peter Damien's misquotations of the fathers on the filioque, pseudo-Clementine literature, faked letters of Pope Clement, a quote from a commentary misattributed to Ambrose, corruptions of passages in St. Ambrose de Penitentia, textual variations in Cyprian's De Unitate, the spurious works of Pope Leo and Galatius, Pope Vigilia's epistle to Bishop uh, Profiturus of Braga, Corruption of the Latin documents relating to the Filioque, the Nog's Head Fable, the inaccurate French translations of the New Testament, the accusation of the Orthodox of various forgeries, which was in fact done by them. This is, uh, if you think of Aquinas' against the errors of the Greeks. Innumerable other uh, misquotations that you could give. So that, that's just a, a basically a working list. Don't forget the Athanasian Creed. That's not written by Athanasius. <laughs> okay, so um, so those are you know pretty common things that were just used as kind of these, oh, these are the knockdown, you know, responses to the Orthodox. Uh, and Rome, you know, I feel pretty certain that almost everything on that list, the modern day Vatican, since Vatican II, would admit are all uh, authentic, authentic forgeries, right? They would admit that those are forgeries. Um, we'll get to the Super Chats now. Uh, wings, one, two, three, ten dollars. Have you heard Russ Dizdar and the idea of Dark Awakening? No, I don't listen to the evangelical people like that, but thank you for that super chat. Bogdan, $7. Do you have any advice on how to deal with doubt and faith? Um, I would say go listen to the um, talks that Metropolitan Jonah did on uh, my channel because I'm not a spiritual father, so it's not really my role to tell you on a personal level how to deal with those kinds of issues. Um, second question, is there a moment in God the Father's existence where he was alone. No, uh, he is eternally the father of an eternal son that he eternally generates. This is basic uh, Nicene Christology and Trinitarian theology that uh, the, the father eternally generates the son. Ben, for $10, to those who have separated from the Orthodox faith and are confusing our brother's anathema. Yes, I put the anathema uh, clip up the other day on my uh, Twitter. Yiska Yvonne, three dollars. Roman Catholics use circular reasoning. If you point that out, they're going that they're going against scripture. They will say that their councils can override scripture. Kinda, yeah. I mean, it depends on how sophisticated the Roman Catholic you're talking to is. Uh, so, a lot of kind of normy Roman Catholics will just say, "Yeah, but we don't listen to the Bible alone. That's dangerous. We go to what uh, the Pope says." But uh, other Roman Catholics more sophisticated will try to deal with this and say, well, um, you know, we don't have a problem with Scripture. It's the right interpretation of Scripture. And you'll find out that the, uh, the papacy has always correctly interpreted the Scriptures. But that's circular because it's just moving the problem back a step. Because now you, as an individual Catholic, have to go and figure out, is that really the case? What is the, I mean, you don't get by osmosis the right doctrines just by believing in the papacy, right? Is it really the case that Vatican II is uh, consistent with what's in Denzinger? Is it? Oh, well, we'll leave that up to the theologians. To, okay, so now you're just basically putting your trust in all of these uh, fallible theologians. I thought the Pope was going to solve this uh, epistemic dilemma for us. Snack, do you have anything you want to say? I know it's, uh, you pointed everything out. 
Duke of Earl, $10. Thank you, Duke of Earl. Much appreciated. Mama Llama, $25. Congratulations on you and Jamie uh, for all that you do for the Orthodox family. Well, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Yep. We are, uh, what, six weeks maybe into being married. So first month and a half of marriage. Uh, It's here. It's fun. We're having a good time. So pray for us because uh, everybody needs prayer. But Jay's Boomer shirt for $10. Jay, the dry cleaner, said to pick up your Boomer shirt at 11.45 tomorrow. Uh, Roger that and we'll be done. I'll be showing up. You'll find me. I'll have my monster energy drink uh, and I'll be pulling up in a uh, uh, Trans Am. So you'll recognize me as the boomer uh, when I pull up. By the way, tonight uh, I'll be on with Ann Coulter. I don't know if I'll be on at the same time as Ann Coulter. Probably not. But Ann Coulter is going on Compound Media with uh, Chrissy Mayer and a bunch of other people to do coverage of the uh, uh, I'm sure to I, I, I feel like this is going to be comedic uh, gold tonight. I mean, I cannot fathom how Joe Biden is going to be able to debate, given that he's basically a dementia patient. But it's going to be fun to see how this uh, they attempt to pull this off. So I will be on a stream with Chrissy Mayer and Coulter, a bunch of other people. So go over to Chrissy's channel tonight. She'll have that up uh, around 930, 1030 our time. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. And uh, be sure and go check out uh, Ubi's work. If you want more of the citations and sources for what we talked about today, go watch my old stream with Snack and George uh, for the forgeries and all that. Um, I'll have the link to Snack's Twitter and whatnot uh, in the show page after this. Uh, Snack, anything you want to leave us with? No, thank you. It, it was um, a short video, but covering it took, uh, took quite a long time, but it, it's very interesting. I think we've pointed out everything that needed to be pointed out and we've even went further. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great, I mean, I'm glad you noticed this, that Baron is basically admitting something was lost. If something's lost, then why does the papacy have the fullness? It's a great point. All right. Uh, God bless everybody. Have a good night and uh, come watch tonight's funny stream.